So <clears throat> let me get started. So today's webinar is about symbols. Uh, it, this is one of our physical in-person uh, experiential learning activities, and uh, we're going to try and give you, it's a bit difficult sometimes, but give you a, a sense of a physical activity through our kind of digital uh, webinar presentation today. So what we're going to cover in the kind of typical format, if you've joined one of these before, is we'll give you a bit of background and introduction to symbols. Uh, we're going to look at how it works from a trainee and a facilitator point of view. And, and having worked with uh, physical materials for 20 years, by far the best way uh, to consider whether a, an activity is right for you as a facilitator is probably to have first experienced it as a trainee. And we don't always get that benefit. So this is perhaps an opportunity to give any of you who don't know the activity a, a sense of that. Uh, I'm also just going to briefly introduce two related activities which are, are similar in, in, in some ways, but, but quite different. And as always, uh, we'll try and get some time at the end for questions. Uh, I do plan to take no more than an hour. So we plan to start at 4 p.m. Uh, UK time will finish at five at the very latest. So in case we don't get time for questions, if you have a burning question, then I suggest popping it into the chat. Uh, Kim will see that. She'll answer you if she can by chat. If not, uh, we can open mics and she can interrupt me and we'll go from there. So I hope that works for everyone. Uh, sometimes we get a bit of background noise, but I think all of us are so used to webinars uh, already that you've all got your mics off. So that's perfect. Thank you. So a little bit of background to symbols. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, RSVP Design started in 2003. We actually had our 20th year anniversary in August of this year. And uh, right at the start, my colleague and founder, Jeff, had decided to create a, a, or improve an existing communications activity he had developed in a previous business called Panjira several years ago. Uh, also to be a, a, a follow-up to Colorblind. And again, if you know a Colorblind activity, that was a communications activity that actually predated our SVP design as well. So uh, as an activity, both in terms of what it was designed to do and, and really the, the design that you more or less see today uh, is, is about 20 years old. So the kind of key areas for learning focus are, as you can see there, uh, collaboration, uh, people have to work together there. Uh, everyone has a part to play in, in solving uh, the problem. It requires effective communication and that's verbal communication. And it's important we try to do that. Uh, it's about goal setting and, and monitoring. There's uh, a goal set by the activity, I guess, it's itself. But how you monitor the activity, the resources you've got, the time to get there is an important part of it as well. Uh, for most groups, it's a pretty uh, challenging problem. The whole idea of experiential learning typically is to try and, and uh, for us, design a focused uh, experiential activity where uh, the behaviours you want people to use are relevant to the workplace. So the problem might seem uh, unfamiliar, but the strategies used to get to it would be relevant to the workplace. And that would include, therefore, some strategic thinking. And overall, it's about it's about helping to, to build teams at its heart. It's a team-based activity. Again, if you don't know it, uh, the same materials that are supplied, you can do it as a single group or you can uh, split into three sub-teams. Many of us work with, uh, with, with uh, partnerships and with uh, hopefully not in silos, but certainly with collaborations with other teams. So for some areas, working it as a sub-team sub -team version may be more important. Uh, and since it's been launched, it's been widely used around the world. Uh, personally, Jeff and I have taken it uh, around Asia, around the US, around Europe, uh, been used in lots of languages. Again, because it's a verbal activity, it doesn't need to be done in any of the languages that it's, it was designed for. It can quite easily be be managed from a, a, a participant point of view in any language that, that wants. And even today, it's still one of our, our top 10 sellers out of our, our portfolio of activities. And you can find it fully translated uh, in German, Polish, and Spanish from the original English. So if you work in any of those languages, either as a facilitator or uh, with participants, then those are, those are available. So this is the kind of description from the... Uh, from the uh, facilitator guide. And, and I think it kind of puts it into to context. Again, if you don't know that activity, you have 
30 magnetic cards. Uh, you have a board in which they, uh, these cards would be able to be connected to. It's a metallized pre-printed grid. And for the group, uh, there's only one way in which the pattern can be assembled. So you've got a, a you've got a target, and that is one opportunity at the end of a planning period to assemble that grid correctly. So the participants ideally never see uh, each other's tiles or cards uh, until they come to that endpoint. So they're relying entirely on describing what they've got and to try and communicate with other people to solve that problem. And at the end of this time period, which you would say as a facilitator, they have to assemble the grid uh, against the clock. Uh, and the team symbols vision, version, as I say, there are three sub-teams that solve part of it, and they come together again for the same uh, time trial. We would estimate about 30 to 45 minutes of that verbal exchange and planning before you get to that last 30-second uh, implementation finale. And, and maybe up to 60 minutes is not that unusual at, at all. So some deliberate designs within that activity. The complexity of information is there on purpose. Uh, if you know our colorblind activity, that has 30 pieces also, but that's 30 pieces of information, whereas there are essentially four symbols on each uh, symbol's tile. So that's four times as much information. And that amount of information, much like the present day, work and environment we all have leads to confusion, ambiguity, uncertainty, a lot of this. So this is an activity to rehearse the kind of skills that would be useful in leadership and in, in team development. And the idea is to get implementation right first time. So if you're working with groups where they have one opportunity to, to launch a new product, to do a new organizational development, to set up a new team, uh, this idea of right first time might be, a, might be appropriate. So, and if you were to go into the website, uh, you'll find that and, and a little more information. Uh, the uh, learning focus right there in the middle, some things in group size and duration, which we'll talk a, li a little about later, and some information on, on the materials that you actually get. So we try to put as much information on the, on the website as possible. So uh, if it was me, I would probably have a question and we do get asked this sometimes, you know, you have on your, your products, you know, copyright 2003, it means that, you know, is it still relevant to the modern day? <clears throat> One way to look at this uh, is I just pulled off from the World Economic Forum, the, the last uh, Future of Jobs report for this year, uh, the top 10 skills of, of 2023. So in terms of, of, of symbols, well, I, analytical Cool uh, thinking is certainly required, particularly in the first part, the first 10 minutes of, of this activity, actually trying to analyze what is going on, what do we have, what are the problem solving approaches we, we would move to. Not so much creative uh, creative thinking, it's about uh, closing down options often in the case of, of, of symbols. But this idea of resilience, uh, very important, uh, I think, in just about any workplace today and important to uh, achieving success in, in symbols. The idea of flexibility and agility, particularly around communication styles and patterns, is, is certainly there and needs to be demonstrated in, in symbols. Uh, motivation, <clears throat> it's always interesting to watch because you get some people like games, some people like puzzles, not everyone does. <clears throat> and keeping a whole team motivated uh, can be quite challenging and, uh, and people being self-aware of their own impact on, on others as they go through this. Not a lot in terms of curiosity, lifelong learning, technological literacy. This is definitely a low-tech activity. Uh, dependability and attention to detail is really important. So if you've got a group who typically skims over things, they will definitely struggle in, in, in symbols. Uh, active listening. Uh, the whole idea of listening is is can be quite a difficult thing to, to teach as in terms of communication. But without active listening, uh, a group will really struggle to, to complete uh, symbols. It can certainly be run as a leadership activity, and we'll talk a little bit later about, about that. And this idea of social influence, uh, really interesting when you do the sub-team version, uh, the three different uh, almost uh, cultures and, and social structures that, that, that can emerge uh, even within 30 minutes of activity. Uh, symbols is one of those where you need someone who's keep, keeping an eye on quality, who's keeping an eye on, on time. So if that's missing, again, it can be a struggle. So not surprisingly, if, if the top 10 skills are required uh, of organizations and some, seven of them are in this activity, it's probably going to mean it's, it's relatively challenging 
uh, and it is, and we make no no uh, uh, apology, I guess, for that. So a little bit of background. Uh, let's see how it works from a participant and a facilitator point of view. So as a facilitator, you get everything you need. Uh, you have an A2 kind of poster size board. Uh, it comes in its own carrying case. The uh, printed grid is usually attached to the board, as are the magnetic tiles. And when you come to this final stage, those tiles can simply be placed on the board, whether it's vertical or flat, and they'll stick. All of the uh, prepared laminates for either the group version or the team version are there, and a full facilitator uh, manual. So uh, the kind of questions we get asked by facilitators, well, what, what size of group? And on the right there, that's a little snapshot from what was said on the website. Uh, group sizes ideally of 6 to 16, possible 2 to 30. These are kind of general bands and a duration of 36, uh, 30 to 60 minutes. In terms of group size, you're really dictated by the number of tiles. So if you have 30 tiles, you want probably more than one. So you could do it with 30 people, but that makes a very big group and I wouldn't recommend it. If you have two tiles as a minimum, people are, tend to be engaged. If you have more than four, they maybe get a little bit overloaded. So that would suggest ideal probably is 8 to 15 rather than 6 to 16. But as I say, these are kind of general areas. One participant could probably manage five tiles without being too much overloaded. That would be a, a group of six. And if you have a leader plus 15, then you could get 16 people. Uh, one tip that I gave to someone recently, they were saying uh, some people, they had a group of eight, some people weren't turning up. Could they do symbols with a group of five? And my suggestion was just take half of the cards, use half of the grid. Everything else on the activity works. And uh, hopefully you'll see that if you're not familiar with it. Uh, if that is a question you want more uh, information on, then, then do please come back to me. In terms of duration, how long will it take? Well, it's kind of how long is a piece of string. Unfortunately, as a facilitator, you probably have a better view than me. If they're a really high-performing team, uh, they could do it in 30 minutes. Uh, it's rare to see it being done in 30 minutes, uh, and a group needed a lot of coaching to be able to do that. But if you've been working or a team has been working together for a while, you're doing a program and you're doing this as a kind of capstone activity at the end of the day, which is very good for, then it is possible. It is possible. Uh, I've had plenty of groups who've worked for 60 minutes and happy to do that. Well, maybe happy isn't the right word, but who's stuck with it. That will provide you with lots of learning, uh, but really test their resilience as, as well. If you're new to this activity, uh, and again, I had this conversation with a customer last week who had used it for the first time, don't be surprised that groups tend not to make much progress in that first 10 minutes. It's such a, a, a different activity and they have so much information they need to get their head around. It's not that unusual, but that's the time maybe to support them with some basic problem solving. And I always suggest don't you know give them some answers, but prompt them, prompt them with some good coaching questions about what they could do or what do they know already? Uh, for those of you who are already thinking about would I use the team version or the group version, if you use the team version, because the group sizes are smaller, there are fewer cards to deal with, and you'll find that out later, that first stage typically progresses a bit faster. But the integration stage and the final stage is a bit more challenging. So overall, I would say that kind of time scale is the same for, for both, either the group size or the... Uh, or the uh, team version. So uh, how does it work? <clears throat> well, this is a brief that people are given. So you could read it out as a facilitator or leader, but I we prefer to have a brief on a single page of A4. Uh, that way there's no confusion about what it's about. So the task, as I, I say, is to, uh, they've got the cards in their hand typically by this time, is to put them in the order in the correct position on this grid, and that's a, a small picture of it. So there's only one pattern will be ex uh, uh, correctly completed. And this is a really important uh, sentence uh, for them to understand and, and probably for you as facilitators to get your head around. If correct, any two adjacent card edges will show matching halves of the same symmetrical symbol. Uh, and often with groups, uh, even if English is their uh, native language, that can be difficult to, to understand. Uh, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, so the information on the cards is individual, may be shared through verbal communication. You're neither to show other people your cards, nor to exchange cards at any stage. So it's really important the uh, participants treat their 
hand of cards as their own knowledge or experience they can just hand on to, to someone. And the process is, so the first part of which takes the longest time is exchange. What have you got in your cards? What do other people have? So you can start to determine which position each card needs to be placed in. And then the second uh, is when they're ready as a facilitator, you do this time trial. And this is typically the first time they'll see them. So they've got 30 seconds to put their 30 tiles on the cards, uh, on, the, on the grid. No stage uh, drawing, marking, marking the grid in any, in any way. Okay. Uh, and uh, ideally, they have one opportunity to complete the task. Where that task completion is maybe important, some, sometimes you could give them a, a second chance to do that if it's important for them to overcome that. So is that clear so far? Uh, again, I, I'm pretty uh, well understand that if you've never seen this before, thanks, Lucy, uh, then that might be a bit confusing. What I tend to do is show people a couple of the tiles. So here's an example of the two arrowheads there. That's uh, two adjacent cards that have a matching halves of the same symmetrical symbol. So the symbol is the two arrows. Half of it is pointing up, half of it is pointing down in, in this case. So uh, those sharp-eyed people or those people who have uh, seen this activity before will see uh, on that small picture on the left, there is a, a colors around the edges of the symbols board and there are colored uh, triangles in each tile. Colour is not mentioned in the brief. <clears throat> and uh, if they ask you about colour at this stage of the exercise, as if it was we were doing it live, I would simply say colour uh, is mentioned in the brief, but you may decide it's important. And that's probably as much information as I would give them at the start. So uh, just give me a quick thumbs up on your camera. Have, who has done symbols before or has watched it being done? Thanks, Penny. Uh, Lucy hasn't. Suzanne has. Let me scroll down some of these others. Thank you, Warren. Uh, okay, so a few people have, a few people haven't. That's great. I'm going to ask you to, to open your, your mics in a second. <clears throat> so let's imagine, and ideally uh, open your mics if you haven't seen this before, because it starts to put you into the position of being a, a participant, which, as I say, I think is quite important. So imagine this is your group of tiles, okay, and uh, you've decided to take the lead. No one else knows what to do, so you're going to take the lead by describing what you have. So you have four tiles in your hand, and uh, that is a picture of Kim's hands from earlier today. Uh, you're going to take the lead by describing what you have to see if anyone has a matching symmetrical symbol. So who fancies opening their mic and trying to uh, tell me how they would describe any of the symbols they see in the tile to see who has a match? Someone want to volunteer for me? I can give it a whirl. Great, thank you. Um, I would say they look like um, a bunch of small bowling balls piled in a triangle. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. And then, uh, so uh, let's imagine that uh, that is one of the cards in red that I can see on the two left. So at this point, if I had both of those, I might be tempted to say I've got a match for that. <clears throat> so you see how there are nine bowling balls. Was it the second one from the right that you were describing? Yes. Yeah, okay. And then there's one on the on the left there. Again, it looks like there are six uh, bowling balls, but they could be stacked kind of behind e each other. So that's quite deliberate. You will find on the tiles that we have in symbols that people need to typically go to another level of of uh, of, of description. So uh, now I've got a really strong verbal, uh, sorry, verbal, a strong uh, a visual test for you. So uh, on the next uh, image here, so these are four different tiles, but two of these tiles would have a match. So just even from memory, <clears throat> And uh, does it look like there's a match for any of either the, the card that was described there with the bowling balls or any other image that was on that uh, previous screen? Anyone think they can see a match who's got excellent visual memory skills from the last picture? Hi, this is Cindy. I see a match with the um, dark plus sign or cross mm -hmm. in this card from the left. From the last tile. Okay. Yep. So again, if someone had said, like Cindy, uh, well, I've got a cross uh, inside, then uh, they might have got two people because one is a white cross, even you can see from this, and one is a dark, a dark cross. But uh, but yeah, absolutely. So here are both together, and you're right, Cindy. 
there's a there was a dark cross in the orange in the first picture on the left, and it now appears on the second one. There's actually a second match. Can people see the second match within those uh, group of four? Never mind, describe it. Uh, yeah, it's like the. It looks like a railway tunnel. <laughs> it's a semicircle that's cut into four bits. Yeah. So say that again for me. So what was the first part of that description, the first one you went to? It looks like the outside of a railway tunnel. A railway tunnel. Great, thank you. And that's a very normal way you'll see people, uh, particularly if you've worked with colourblind, the way people will describe things. Some people prefer to communicate and describe things in pictures, so they'll tell you the whole thing. It's like a, a railway tunnel. Often if there are technical people, engineers like me, they might describe it in components part. So I might have said it's two semicircles with three, you know, radiants going out from it. Uh, but looking at the picture, it's much easier to describe it as a, as a railway tunnel. So, yeah. So what else do you notice about those two pictures in terms of colours? <clears throat> so I said colour wasn't mentioned in the brief, uh, but it may become important. So if you if if you imagine we are looking at the back of of each other's cards and uh, they're deliberately again rectangular and most people will hold them as Kim has like a card of of playing cards with with portraits, but what if I talk about top and bottom, left and right? <clears throat> well, what I see is that there's four colors on each card, and they're yeah. consistent. The blue and green are always in the same positions, and the yellow and Red mm -hmm. are always in the same positions. Yep, absolutely. So as we start to try and get a match between us, what tends to happen is, uh, first of all, we need to know how do we do things around here? Which way is up? Because if I can't see your tiles and I'm saying, well, uh, I've got, uh, if I look at this one on the left, I've got a necklace of four circles uh, and it's in blue. Uh, but but uh, I've also got a railway tunnel that's in red and Kim says, well, I've got a railway tunnel that's in orange. One of the things we need to do is to orientate things. And if you see this happening uh, early, uh, that would be my coaching question is, how do you know which way is up in this organization? And most people would say, ah, so if the grid is green at the top, why don't we all hold our cards green at the top? Because if I put those two cards side by side, I can't get an adjacent symmetrical symbol uh, if you see between the card on the left and the card on the right, what I would need to do is to turn it upside down. So if everyone holds green to the top, now I can get a matching symmetrical symbol. And that's a really important part to get groups started. And it's a really important part about starting to develop culture, starting to develop good communication in teams. How do we do things around here? So what I tend to do if they're working in a semicircle is just wander around and if I see people holding the way Kim was here, some green to the top, some blue to the top, suggest how do you know which way is up, okay? Uh, and you can, incidentally, most people would do it green. I have seen it done the other way. It just confuses me. If you have a green at the top of the grid why you would hold blue, but it, you can build it that way. It just kind of technically looks a bit upside down for me. So is that clear about orientation and how the group would get started? Does that make sense for, for people? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So from there, uh, again, those uh, who haven't uh, played it before, how do you think you would build out? So you've now had your first two cards at match. You're all holding green to the top. How do you then build out? How do you think you would then build out to find out where all 30 cards go to? What kind of strategies off the top of your head would you start to have? I think Ram, you could start from the angles because you don't have any match. Great. Thank you, Guido. Yeah, absolutely. So again, it doesn't say it in the brief, but it would be a good guess to say, well, what happens when we get to the edge? And when you get to the edge on the left-hand side at the red, as you can see on that, that grid there, it doesn't need to have a matching symmetrical symbol uh, because it's not adjacent at that side. And at the green at the top on that first row, it wouldn't have a match. And on the right and the orange and at the bottom at the blue. So, yeah, so you could go side by side as you started there uh, horizontally. And when you get five in a row, you're probably not going to have any match. And then you could go up and down. So that's what groups tend to do. And they start to feel their way through that. Uh, and when I talk about this first 10 minutes being a real challenge, it's getting that first match and then deciding where to go from, from there. Once, group, once that group 
understanding is passed through, then they tend to make progress relatively quickly. Any other ideas or any other facilitators or seen for how people go about, you know, getting started with, with symbols? Anything else unusual that's worked or indeed hasn't worked? That's fine. That's uh but those are the those are the two methods and, and really at some point you have to get to that. So whether groups formally go through it and, and say, well, let's number the rows, you know, one to six, and let's number the columns one to five or A, B, C, D, and let's work out how we we do this somehow without showing each other the cards, they've got to figure out where the cards would go in this in this grid. And what about part two then? So let's imagine now we have 30 tiles between us as a group. We all know where in this uh, grid our, our cards would go. How, how do you think you should do this? What do people think if you haven't seen it done? 30 cards on the, the board in 30 seconds. Does that seem like a challenge? Does it sound easy? What, what do you reckon? challenging yeah absolutely it is <clears throat> and uh and and what do you think most groups are ready to do as soon as they've figured out where the cards are, are going what behavior have you seen those who have, have, have seen it done is there much rehearsal is there much uh practice or do you just go and say right right let's go for it Somebody's got to be bold and start it. I haven't yeah. seen it done. Somebody's got to be willing to take the first step. Yeah, yeah, that that's certainly true. Uh, the the bit I said earlier about quality control, <clears throat> I pretty much guarantee you, if they haven't rehearsed a process for how they're physically going to go to the board and put these cards on, they're unlikely to be able to do it in thirty seconds. Just the cho choreography of getting you know somewhere between six and fifteen people to the board putting on a magnetic pile in the right place, stepping away. <clears throat> and if they try to do a visual match, uh, they'll certainly not do it. So it's a, it's a, if it's a one-shot process and any time you're going to be launching a new product, doing anything where you only have one chance to get it right, you ought to rehearse it. And again, this activity is deliberately designed to have 30 minutes of planning and a 30-second time trial. <clears throat> And uh, if you put the same investment in, in practice in that 30 minutes and in the 30 seconds, then you're probably not going to succeed because I would suggest only having a few seconds practice. You really need to rehearse what's going to happen before you do it. So again, that might be important in the group that you're working in, in which case you you know make a point of, of reviewing that in particular. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not. Uh, Lucy, uh, do you have a question? Just open your mic. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I see on a table a uh, pen and a paper. Mm -hmm. So are the participants allowed to make some notes before they will do the final move? Yeah, we suggest in the brief no. Uh, this was actually a, a conference environment, so they already had paper and pens on their table, and we felt, well, we probably won't, won't, won't do it. Uh, it doesn't really make a, a, an issue. What we're trying to prevent is people simply drawing pictures or, or writing instructions. We want this to be about verbal discussion. So that's why the focus of it, of it was on. Quite often they will, you know, as they get to this point, they may be writing down their process. And if it's really important to you, I probably wouldn't uh, stop them from doing that because in real life you would probably want, want to do it. But, but generally, certainly the first stage should be encouraged to be about a verbal discussion. Does that answer your question? Great, thank you. Okay, uh, and as I say, because they're magnetic tiles, you know, it's relatively easy to be done flat. You can do it on a flip chart, you can do it on, on, on a board. But unless there's a process, you know, like that middle uh, picture there with everyone trying to get on it first, it just becomes a, a, a bit of a mess. So uh, it does have some process steps you really want the, the group to be able to, to do. So I just, I, sorry, I just want to interrupt and say it works uh, without having people drawing. Uh, we don't allow pen and paper when we do it. Uh, however, we accept, although we say verbal communication, we accept hand communication because that's at some point they will describe things with their hands. And so that's kind of okay. It's hard to monitor everybody. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point. And and what I often say is the thanks, Suzanne. The, uh, the 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 rules are kind of for guidance. And once you get to understand the activity, you'll you'll understand which rules can be flexed and which which would not be. And again, I always say, look at the culture of your organisation. You know, if I'm working for a a nuclear inspectorate team, I want them to follow rules. If I'm dealing with a a marketing team or a, a research and development group, I want them to be you know a bit more creative. So, uh, so this is an example of a of a review question, and these, you know, more detail is in the notes. But if you're using it as a communication challenge in its own, you probably wouldn't want to to put a leadership uh, role in. You would want to see where that develops and see how it flows around the the group. Lots of open questions about how are people encouraged to contribute, you know, because you will always get that typically in a group. Some people who are, are uh, more extrovert, some are more introvert. How do you bring them into the dialogue? What types of questions work, particularly at the exploratory stage uh, at, at, at the beginning? Uh, you can go into quite technical areas. So we have clients who use it purely for project management, where the emphasis is on the, the task and the resource. The objective needs to be really clear and well understood at the start, and often that's not with most groups, so it's worthwhile spending a bit of time. Uh, typically, you would uh, appoint a manager or a leader in, in, in this case, uh, so lots of lots of areas you could explore. My, my biggest piece of advice for any facilitators looking at using symbols is be really clear on what learning you want to extract before you begin the activity. Because it's quite a complex and difficult project, there'll be lots of learning that comes out. So you want to be able to focus uh, on that. So uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to nip on to the uh, team-based version. So as I mentioned, you can do it as a single group. You could do this as, as three sub-teams. And the way we do it as three sub-teams is uh, we have a slightly different brief. And that map, as you can see at the bottom, uh, so the first stage is, is exactly the same. Uh, you have 30 cars divided amongst your group. Uh, only one pattern will be correct. And at the end, you have to uh, to place 30 cabs on the board uh, in the correct order. So the setup is slightly different as a facilitator. So what you would have to do, and again, this is in the facilitator, facilitator guide, start with the picture on the right, which is the completed tiles in the correct order, and then uh, extract the six dark gray and six, uh, the four dark gray according to that pattern, the two rows of light blue, and then separate the, the, the six lightly shaded in a block of four. And that gives you your three groups of 10. So you need to do that before you start. Then simply shuffle them uh, and let the uh, participants of the three sub teams uh, pick them up. So uh, my suggestion is to kind of keep them out of earshot of each other. They don't necessarily need to be in separate rooms, but separate part of the rooms. Uh, and what they are told is uh, you begin in one of these three sub-teams. You have 10 tiles in your group, but at this stage, you don't know if you're a block of six and four or two rows. And your job is to exchange information verbally within your sub-team about what is on your cars to determine whether you have blocks or rows. So if you were part of that, knowing the way these cards go together now, what kind of questions would you be asking of your teammates uh, to try and find out whether you've got a, a block of six and four or two rows of five? What what type of thing are you going to try to to, to sort out? If you if you have um uh, if you have no matches on the short sides, you are the mm -hmm. two, let's say. Two rows. Two, yeah. Correct. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if you can get a match side to side in, in, in more than three cards, you already know your, your rows. <clears throat> and, uh, and interestingly, that's the group that typically finishes first because that's the easiest thing to do. A bit more difficult to get a match top and bottom and side to side out, out, out of your four. So again, the way this is set up is that uh, the two rows who are finished first will probably put their hands up and say, okay, we know where there are two rows. Now can we get together to, to figure out where we sit? Because although you've got two rows of five, you don't know which is that one towards the top and which is the bottom row. And you won't find that out until you collaborate with the, with the other group. So this stage one is to, to work out which type of block you have. And the timings would typically be the, the same. Are you two rows? Are you six and four? Stage two is to indicate when you're ready to collaborate with the other two teams. And as a facilitator, I think it's interesting to see, you know, who is ready. Do you let them just go and uh, approach the other teams or do you wait until everyone is ready? Uh, and then once you get together <clears throat> with, with that, let me go back to that. So what kind of questions 
So if you you've now you know your your two rows, when you go to visit the other team, what kind of questions are you going to to have for them? And one way I've seen it being done is, uh, and, and certainly it's easier if you tend to send one person rather than a whole group. Uh, again, some good leadership lessons in there. So you imagine you've got a team of three, uh, one uh, represented from the two rows. If the people with the two rows start to look for a match on the bottom, <clears throat> if they can get a match with their uh, uh, at the bottom of their cards at the top of someone else's, then they can identify that that row will be in the middle. If they can't get any match with the bottom tiles in their row, then they know where their row goes, and that will allow them to figure out where the other uh, two groups go. Okay. Hopefully uh, that is making some sense. It makes more sense when you have all of the materials. Uh, but the team, the team version works well, uh, particularly when looking at leadership. Uh, obviously, you can set three leaders within the group or you can rotate leadership round. So lots of good leadership uh, support and advice that would come out in using the, the team symbols version. Uh, and these are some of the questions. Again, you will find all of this in the in the facilitator uh, guide. So a lot of it is about managing relationships with the groups, uh, making sure that they have a strategy, and then coming back with a, a a a common way of approaching this final. So this idea of how do you integrate the three teams into this thirty second time trial. And typically, I find that the that when you do the team version, there's a little more. Uh, integration of how you're actually going to do that. So often that final stage is done better within the, the three sub-team versions. So another question we get all of the time uh, is, you've just described this to me, Graham, it looks horrendously complicated, it looks very difficult. What is the likely success rate of anyone ever being able to do symbols or team symbols? Uh, and my answer is that these are high performance team activities. So if your group isn't a high performing team, they may not succeed, especially in that time trial that I mentioned. Often groups will get their discussion, figure out where they're going, but, but fail in the time trial. Uh, and as consultants, we're typically brought in to make teams better. So it's maybe no, no surprise. <clears throat> if they're a, a leadership group, if they are have been working for a long time together, you probably would expect them to be able to be successful. <clears throat> but the other thing to remember is if you're using this as a development activity, as a facilitator over 45 or even 60 minutes, you've got lots of opportunities to coach teams. You've got lots of opportunities to stop, look at what's not working and help coach them to make things that are going to improve out of the communication or their way of, of working. Stop for a learning and review every 10 minutes. Uh, I know groups who run symbols over, you know, three cohorts, you know, uh, do it in three three chunks, let the group come back, use what they've learned and have another go. So there's lots of ways of, of, of using symbols rather than just the first hit. Uh, <clears throat> and if they don't, dis can't discriminate, uh, sorry, can't demonstrate or won't demonstrate the wide range of skills required, then they are going to struggle. So it's useful for, for pointing that out. Uh, it is more difficult for new teams, and I wouldn't recommend it as the first thing you do. This is not an icebreaker activity. Keep it towards the end or keep it when teams are, are, are ready. Uh, but you'll find that it has a, a fantastic uh, element as a closing activity, particularly when for the first time they see these tiles in, in, in the correct place. So uh, I hope that was, that was useful in terms of symbols. <clears throat> I wanted just to cover two similar uh, related activities. And again, if you're familiar with our products, you, you may know this. <clears throat> so one of the questions we got uh, early on was, uh, I'm working with larger groups. I'm working with uh, uh, sales teams coming together, as you as you saw that earlier one. I, I, I showed you a picture of the groups in, in conference, so you can use symbols at a table. But clients who say, well, actually, I want everyone to be involved in the same activity. So Super Symbols takes that same kind of idea. It will work with up to 150 people, and they start off in six different groups of 25. And you can just about make out from that picture on the left there that you have four symbols, uh, but they're square so that you don't have the orientation issues. And what the group has to figure out is similar to the team symbols. How do their 25 tiles go together? And then how do we put the different groups together? And it's to do with, with, with color and patterns. And at the end, uh, again, you can't really see these pictures too well, but they uh, slot all their cards instead of onto a magnetic board. This is a much larger 
uh, poly uh, a clear clear grid and they put pop them into poly pocket. So 150 cards go on. This time they've got five minutes to do it. If all the cards are in the correct situation, you turn the grid round and it's like uh, pixels. It will it will uh, actually create a, a picture. Uh, we typically use a, a series of growing trees, but you can actually have it customized to make it a, a conference themed logo. So super symbols is a larger version, but works on, on a very similar similar way. And then more recently, uh, everything you can do with the physical version, you can do with what's called Symbols Online. So this works on our online platform, which is uh, something we developed during COVID for those who are not aware. But again, it works in exactly the same way. Uh, you start off only seeing your own tiles. Uh, in this case, on the uh, digital version, uh, people are not able to see them. Uh, you can turn off screen sharing, for example, so they've got no choice but to do it verbally. And then when you get to the time trial, they drag their tiles into the correct place in the, in, in the grid. So that happens. And again, you can do the team symbols uh, version. So everything that's available in the physical version of, of uh, symbols, you can work with groups online. And it works alongside any uh, video conferencing that you use, whether it's Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or, or indeed anything else. I haven't run it yet, and I have both the online and the physical version. Mm -hmm. Is the online version, I think you probably have that in your suite of services to kind of review as well. Is that more complicated than running it in the live face-to-face -face version? Uh, it's not more complicated, Jennifer. I mean, the, the, the gameplay is exactly the same. You know, so you start off with a group of tiles. You've got people on open mics right, trying to figure them out, themselves out. One of the things I've found, and I don't know if it's kind of, you know, our all of our experiences since, since COVID, people have become much more used to uh, letting others have airtime on uh, video conference calls. That doesn't always happen in person. So what people tend to be more used to, I think, is, is getting inputs and making sure they get inputs, in my experience. Uh, so... I've tended to see symbols work better in the digital version, but I think it's that kind of uh, experience of being maybe a bit more uh, encouraging of bringing people forward. Okay, great, thank you. But but largely it would take the same time, you know. Uh, and again, we hear that you know people won't want to do an activity or won't want to be online, you know, for an hour at a time. You know, if people are engaged and they tend to get engaged pretty quickly with activities like this, then they will they will stay uh, and they will they will take part. Uh, I mean, clearly, people will sit in front of a TV or a computer screen for for longer than fifteen minutes or a, an hour if they're watching something and engaging. So it, it it does tend to work uh, reasonably well. Any others who have experience, particularly of the physical version, want to, to share that with, with Jennifer? Did you say, Jennifer, you haven't run the physical version yet? I haven't. I purchased okay. both. Um, so trying to learn as much as I can from all you. Sure. No problem. Anyone offer, uh, Jennifer, any advice having run it? Uh, I have a question, Graham. Sure. N um, never tried this activity. But, uh, I use the column blind a lot of time. Okay. So my question is, can you use those activities in sequence, or if you ever tried uh, which sequence you suggest, uh, or I mean the difference differences sure. between the two. Yeah, ab absolutely. So it was designed to be used in sequence. It was designed to be a more challenging activity to do, to do after colorblind. Uh, and to take, I guess, I mean, there, there's probably about 15 years uh, difference between the development of the two activities. And over that period, uh, the amount of communication, if you think back to, you know, this is late 90s, early 2000s, the amount of communication through electronic was getting more and more and more. So the idea in symbols is, you know, how do you how do you sift through that difficulty of more and more information? So in Colorblind, what you're doing is how do you share information when you don't share the same visual frame of reference? That stayed within symbols. So we still do a lot of communication by email and and not on a webinar like this when we can see, but how do we simplify it? And the trick, which I didn't mention, but of course in symbols is that although you have four tiles, you have four, sorry, you have four symbols on each tile, 
if you're really precise, I can say, Guido, I'm looking for a match in my green triangle. Uh, so you can forget every color of your except the blue because it can only be in that blue. And that's a way of finding ways to simplify getting through another level of, of information. So that's one of the tricks and the differences for symbols, but it is a tougher activity. And I would suggest you do colorblind and then symbols if you want to give the group another challenge, or indeed if you want to see if they can put the learning they took from colorblind into another activity. Yeah, thank you. Suzanne, I know you've run it a few times. What kind of level of success do you see with, with, with groups? So yes, we do run quite often with groups that know each other. Um, and we have often two rooms. So one group of 30, uh, well, with 30 tiles and another one. So there is competition, even if um, it's not a competitive activity. What we found is sometimes people have the impression they won't make it. But I think it's important to tell them to try until the end, um, and because during the 30 second, some can still adjust the tiles. And I think some succeed indeed in the last 30 seconds. So I think it's important that they push and gain learnings, even if some, I have experienced one too, <laughs> I don't, are so resilient and they want to drop off while doing the activity. Yeah, yeah, that can, I, that can be tough. And again, you know, uh, it's hard to it's hard to gauge, but you know you may. One of the tricks I've used, if I if I kind of know a group is going to struggle and I really want them to succeed, I I, I could say look, you know, thirty seconds is absolutely the pinnacle of of performance. You know, most groups would take you know up to two minutes. Uh, if it's important for the group to feel that they've got that success and they've worked hard, then yeah, I think as a facilitator, it makes sense to to kind of flex that a, a little bit. Indeed, we. For those who are not, we overrun the 30 second and still we say, okay, you did it in two minutes, but you did it. Yeah, yeah. And and for reference, I, I've seen it done in, in 19 seconds, you know. Uh you know, it 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 is possible, but but it tends to be with a group who's used to working in, in, in that way and, and working uh working with a team very often. Everyone for joining and for your participation. I hope that was that was useful. Uh, like all of these, we'll record it, edit it a little bit. And it will be there as a reference if people need to go to go back. But by all means, reach out if you have any questions on symbols or the, or the other products. We'd be happy to talk more about your situation because, uh, again, I understand it's quite daunting the first time uh, first time you use it. But hopefully, as uh, as as some people on this call know, we're we're happy to 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 help try and get you up to speed and and confident in using it. Thank you. I'll